quick tools. Hello everyone. Halloween is around the corner again, and I'm going to do a quick exercise of me making this Tim Burton-esque stylized werewolf character to try out my new pen display. First of all, I want to shout out huge thanks to Huayon for sponsoring my Canvas 16 2021 pen display for this review. This model features a 15.6 inch display panel and IPS screen that supports 1920x1080 resolution. The pen display also came with the ST300 adjustable stand that allows up to 6 different resting angles. Now, when you think about pen displays, you usually think about graphic artists using it for digital illustrations in programs such as Photoshop. I'm not a concept artist myself, so I think it'll be nice to make this video where I'm going to review this product from a 3D artist's perspective. For this purpose, I've decided to show you the process of me making this werewolf character from start to finish by utilizing the Canvas 16 2021 as much as I could throughout the entire workflow. What I want to do is to focus on the experience of using the pen display from a 3D artist's point of view and give my honest opinion about how you can benefit from using one. Therefore, I won't be covering much of the specs or technical aspects of the product in detail as there are already many videos out there that cover this topic. Make sure to watch till the end of the video for my review of this pen display. Because of time constraints, I'm going to speed up the majority of the workflow and comment about my creative process over the time-lapse video. I'm going to start from scratch with this default cube and hand model the base mesh by freestyling it. I already have a rough idea of how I want my werewolf to look, so I'm just going to play with the shapes to get close to what I have in my mind. I'm still using the mouse and keyboard at this stage because I'm more used to the shortcut keys on the keyboard. So right here, I'm deleting half of the model away because I want to use the mirror modifier as early as possible. Doing this gives me a cleaner viewport to work with, and I do not have to worry about selecting vertices on the wrong side of the mesh while editing. Then, I'm just slowly adding edge loops and extrusions to the mesh as I go. While working on the blocking, it's important to make sure that the form is easy to read in all angles. That's why you'll often see me moving the viewport around because I'm trying to see if the silhouette of the character is aesthetically pleasing or not and making sure that the line of action is correct. Here, I'm adding the subdivision modifier to give it more geometry because I'm going to have to paint some weights later. So it's important to have a considerable amount of vertices in the base mesh. You can now see that I'm slowly refining and adding more details where it is needed such as the facials, the hands and a bit here and there. I'm also trying to fix some areas where the arc in the body or arm seems a bit crooked. Here, you see me trying to move the legs to the front because the center of gravity feels a bit off. But moving the legs forward also kind of makes it look weird. So in the end, I kept it the same way. Once I have the basic shape blocked out, I apply the mirror and subdivision modifier. You can see that I've disabled the optimal display and go back and forth between one and two subdivisions to have a final look at the topology density. In this case, more is better. Finally, it's time to add the multi res modifier so that we could add subdivisions to the mesh for sculpting. But before I start sculpting, I also added the eyeballs for reference. Right now, I'm using the pen display for sculpting. And in the beginning, you can see I'm still getting used to the working area of the huge panel. Before this, I was only using a 7 inch pen tablet. So it definitely took me a little while to get used to the sudden amount of available extra space to work with. While you can customize the 10 available buttons on the pen display, I still find myself using the keyboard for my secondary hand because the hotkeys are naturally positioned for the fingers on the keyboard. Also, the hotkeys for your customizable buttons might differ greatly when working in sculpt mode versus the other modes. And I don't think that the driver has options for multiple profiles for the same program. Back on the topic of the character, I try not to focus too much on the details on the body, as I know it's going to be mostly covered with hair. So I try to give the nose and mouth more attention and buff out the character overall. Then I proceeded by giving the fingers and toes more definition and work on the pants. Personally, I like to use the block brush a lot when I sculpt. It allows me to very quickly add form to the mesh I'm working on. Then, I either use the inflate, pinch, or grab brushes to refine the details some more. I think the character looks alright now. Let's give it some teeth. As you can see, I'm making a tooth out of a cube. Just keep it simple and get the shape looking right. There's no need to worry about the anatomy since it's a stylized character. 
Then I just duplicate instances of the two to make more, so that I can easily just edit one to apply the changes to each of them automatically. To make it look more interesting, I selected the rows of teeth and randomized their position and rotation a little bit. You can do this by selecting the objects and search for the randomize transform command. For those who don't know or can't remember where certain commands are hidden in the drop down menus, just press F3 and search for them. Once I'm done with the teeth, I duplicate one of them to use it for the fingernails and toenails. Again, I'm just doing this very roughly and not worrying too much about how they join with the flesh because it's going to look like they came out of the hair anyway. Afterwards, I jump back to sculpting mode to add some more details in the mouth. I wanted to make the gums wrap around the teeth properly and make it look like they actually grew out of it. Once that's done, I added a couple of vertex groups for what's going to be used for the hair particles. The first vertex group is going to be the density map for the hair. So for this, I'm going into edit mode to select all the vertices and assign them to this vertex group. Then I'll paint away the parts where I don't want there to be hair, such as the inside of the mouth, the eyes, and of course, the pants. To avoid performance lag, turn down the subdivision in the multi-res modifier while painting the weight map. Once again, I'm using the pen display for weight painting. Obviously, it can be very difficult to get nice smooth strokes with the mouse. It's also nice to use the pen display because it offers pressure sensitivity input so that I can dictate the strength that I want when I paint. The second vertex group is going to be the weight map for the hair's length. Again, I'm starting by assigning the weight of the entire body's hair length at maximum, then slowly painting away the areas where the hair should be shorter. Don't worry about getting it as close to final as possible, as we can still edit the weight map after we've added the hair. But right off the bat, I would imagine the cheeks, eyebrows, and chest area to have much more longer hair than the rest of the body. I'm going to quickly rename the vertex groups, and you can also see that I've prepared a third one for the clumping later on. Now that the maps are ready, it's time to add the hair particles. First thing I want to do is adjust the hair length. Set this to the maximum length you want your hair to be, and try not to leave it too long as it may make it very difficult to see where we style the hair later on. Then, set the number of parent hairs you need. Then go to the Children tab and select Interpolated to display the hair in between the parent hairs. By default, it will show you the amount of 10 out of 100 to give you a rough representation of how the entire thing looks like. If you want to see the actual amount for what it is, just crank it up to 100 or whatever is the render amount that you want. Now, scroll down to the Vertex Group tab and assign the Vertex Group for hair density that we've painted earlier. Do the same for the hair length as well. As you can see, the overall length is still quite long, and I will have to go back to editing the weight map for the hair length again later. But for now, look for the timing drop down under the Render tab and move the slider for random to the maximum. This will randomize the length of your hair particles. We will also be adjusting the clumping values but let's leave it for now. So let's get to editing the weight map for hair length. I always switch off the visibility of the hair particles to avoid performance lag when I'm painting the weight maps. What I've learned is that displaying the hair particles in weight paint mode does not really display the actual end result. So when I think I'm done, I will switch back to object mode and turn on the hair particles again to check. Now that the length is settled, it's time to style the hair. To do this, switch to particle edit mode and you will see a set of tools dedicated to hair styling on the left of your viewport. Be warned though, that once you start styling, you will no longer be able to modify the particle amount and length. If at any time after styling you need to make these changes, you have to reset the edits you've made in the particle edit and start from scratch again. This is the perfect time for me to switch back to the pen display again. With the comb tool selected, just draw the strokes in the direction we want to comb the hairs. This is arguably the most time consuming part of doing hair and you can see why I mentioned keeping the hair length just right, even though we are using vertex group to drive it. Switch back to object mode to check the results. Here I'm trying to adjust the lighting and render settings to give me a better preview of the hair. By default, the hair will inherit the same materials you have for the mesh. Let's just give it a nice brown color for now so that we can see the ambience and highlights more clearly. I'm currently checking for areas where it looks like it's balding and has empty patches. If we go back into particle edit mode, we can see more clearly there's this empty area on the arm. 
We can use the add tool to add parent hairs where we want by just clicking on the mesh. I'm not sure if there's a workaround for this, but whenever I try to use a pen to add hairs, Blender thinks that I'm continuously adding hairs even though I'm only tapping once. I also experienced the same issue when I was using the pen tablet in different projects, so in the end, I still have to use the mouse to add single strands of hair. Just keep combing the hairs and make sure no nooks and crannies are missed out. I think this is done, so let's go back to object mode to check the results. I think it looks good. Oh, don't forget to increase the subdivision to check it at the intended resolution. The hairs around the hand seem to be intersecting the mesh. Let's try and fix it. Here's a tip. Never alter the subdivision when you are in particle edit mode as it could mess up the hairstyle of the entire mesh. As you can see, I totally missed and ignored it. By the time I noticed it, it's already too late to undo and I had to redo the hairstyle again. Anyway, let's fast forward and check the results again. Now sometimes, you will get results like this where your hair roots are intersecting with the mesh. To fix this, we can go back to particle edit mode and use the puff tool to make the hair roots stand up. So what I'm doing now is just lightly brush the overall hair particles to puff them up a bit. Now it looks much better. The next thing I want to try and fix is the lack of hair around the face. If we go to particle edit mode, we can see that there aren't many hair parents around here. So let's add some and comb them. You can select these individual hairs by pressing L with your cursor on top of the hairs so you don't affect the other hairs when you style them. The face is still not fully covered, so I've decided to add another hair particle to address this. I'm going to create a new vertex group for the density of this new hair particle and paint out the face. Then I'm going to let the weight average out at the neck area so that it slowly eases out where the long hair takes over. It's better to name the particles when working with more than one so we don't get mixed up. So I'm just going to create the new hair particle now and go through the same thing as before. Just that this time I want the hairs to be very short. I think it looks good now. Let's play with the clumping. Once we add some clumping, it will give the werewolf so much more character and stylization. If you change this value, this is going to affect the entire hair particles, but I'll only want the clumping in certain areas, so let's go edit our weight map for clumping now. I want the clump map to be somewhat similar to the hair length map, so that wherever the hair is long, they will clump together. The results look good. We can see the progression from clumpy to straight hairs quite clearly. But this skin patch is kind of bothering me, so let's quickly go ahead and fix it. It is at this moment that I realized that I needed short hair to also cover the hands. Adding the weight there does give me the hairs, but I don't get the parent hairs in particle edit mode anymore, because like I said, once you start styling, you can't change the parent hair amount anymore. I probably can still manually add the hairs, but I think it's much faster to reset and redo it again since the short hairs are relatively easy to style. At this stage, I'm just cleaning up the weight maps here and there to remove any odd hairs and fix the length of certain areas. With the hair done, it's time to move on to the shading and materials. I'm going to create different alpha maps for each of the distinct parts of the character to keep everything under one material. The first one I'm going to work on is the mouth, so let's create a new image texture and go to UV edit mode to create a new UV map for the mesh. Then switch to texture paint mode and paint the inside of the mouth white. Sometimes it can be hard to see with the highlights on, so I suggest toggling it on and off in the viewport settings so that you don't confuse the highlights for the painted parts. Don't forget to save your texture when you are done. With the alpha map, we can now use it with a mixed shader node to assign different shaders for the mouth. I'm going to repeat this process with the pants and nose. In the end, you should have something like this. Next, let's give the hair a proper hair material. Select the werewolf and add a new shader. Choose the principal hair BSDF. Then in the particles render tab, select the newly created hair shader. Keep in mind that the principal hair BSDF only works with cycles. Play around with the settings to get your desired results. And I must say that we've come to the part where 90% of the remaining work is polished. 
so I'm going to skip ahead to the lighting and final render. So without further ado, here's my review of the Canvas 16 2021. When I first unboxed the product, my first impression of it was that this thing is huge. Being a 7 inch pen tablet user, the Canvas 16's 15.6 inch display is a really huge upgrade for me. The screen is also big enough that I can still comfortably navigate around the UI even when the display is mirroring my 4K display of my monitor. It also features a fully laminated screen with anti-glare matte film, which means that the screen is thinner and there's no parallax when you are drawing on it. If you are not working with a dual monitor setup, this pen display is going to be your best friend. Being a 3D artist, it is so nice to be able to free up the entire screen solely for a blender and have your reference material on a separate screen while you are working on something. There's no more need to cram your pure ref overlay at the corner of your screen and work with a smaller viewport or tap in and out between browsers. As a pen tablet user, you are always required to look at your monitor when you're working. Because of this, I would often mess up a stroke because the tablet is oriented incorrectly with my hand, especially when I need to make long curvy strokes on the tablet. Most of the time it's always guesswork, or I will have to rely on muscle memory whenever I draw the first stroke. With the Canvas 16, you get to see exactly where you are putting the tip of your pen on, giving you full control and confidence in your strokes. It just feels a lot more natural when working with sculpts or texture painting in general. I also like the fact that I can adjust the orientation of the display just like you would with a real sketch pad and still get the stroke actions right at every angle. This can be really difficult to do with a pen tablet. I've spent about 4.5 hours working on the werewolf character on and off, but I still kept the pen display on during my breaks. All in all, I think it was on for about 6 or 7 hours straight and I never once felt uncomfortable resting my hand on a pen display because of overheating issues. This is definitely a good plus for artists who are full-time sculptors or texture painters. There's one area where I feel that the Canvas 16 can improve on. There is no option to swap between screen displays with a hotkey. Personally, I would have preferred to be able to work on the monitor when I'm not using the pen display and have my references on the pen display instead. If I need to go into weight painting or sculpt mode, it'd be nice to be able to quickly swap the screens instantly with one of the customizable buttons so that I could immediately grab the pen and get to work instead of having to drag the programs across the displays. I see that this is also a commonly requested feature among the users community and hopefully Huion can grant us this wish with a driver update in the future. All in all, the Canvas 16 2021 pen display is really nice to work with. The screen is very responsive and the pen offers really great pressure sensitivity. I can see 3D artists who sculpt a lot benefit from this product as you would definitely get more precise results in comparison with a pen tablet. If you're a texture artist, then I think this pen display will also aid you greatly when doing texture painting in Blender or working in programs like Substance Painter or Photoshop. I hope that you liked this video and that it has offered you some insight regarding pen display usage from a 3D artist perspective. If there's anything I've missed or left out, do leave a question in the comment section and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Until next time, thank you for watching, save your file, and I'll see you in the next video. Hi! <laughs> Subscribe! <laughs>